Hola, buenas tardes. Good evening. Welcome to En Casa con la Plaza. My name is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm the Marketing and Communications Director at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. En Casa con la Plaza is our virtual programming. We've been online since April of 2020, going on our 170th episode. And here we are. Uh, these are presentations, demonstrations, conversations, and performances from our home to yours during these pandemic times and also beyond. We've already opened up La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. We're open six days a week, closed only on Tuesdays, so come on by. Weekdays from 12 to 5, weekends from 10 to 5 in the afternoon. We're also our, also our La Tienda Museum gift store is open as well. We'd like to thank our sponsors, CVS Health, Aetna, Union Pacific Foundation, Kaiser Permanente, the California Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and also the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Again, La Plaza has been open. All of our exhibits are up. However, we're opening, we're preparing our second floor gallery with a brand new exhibit. We'll, have, we'll announce what's going on a little bit later uh, in the week. Also, La Plaza Cocina, our, our combination museum, teaching kitchen and tiendita is now open right across the street from La Plaza on Spring Street, Monday through Friday, 12 to 5 p.m., currently exhibiting Maiz, Past, Present, and Future. Uh, with that, if you're on Facebook, please, we have our comment section. Guadalupe Diaz Isa, for instance, has joined us and told us buenas tardes. So yeah, let us know that, that you're here. Do shout outs, ask questions. Same if you're on Zoom. We have the chat feature. You could uh, make comments, ask questions, also use the Q&A feature. We'll take your questions after the conversation. So with that, let me introduce to you our tonight's guest host, Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz with the Mexican-American Cultural Education Foundation. Welcome, Dr. Ruiz. Hello, what a pleasure. Um, and what an honor to have tonight our a very special guest. Our, our, uh, we're, we're honoring one of the most, uh, um, you know, energetic and one of the people that is making us the most proud in politics, uh, Senator Maria Elena Durazo. Um, and, and, you know, we are the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation and our mission is to change the distorted, uh, unfair, uh, perspective on the narrative about Mexican Americans, because we're we're tired of the the two hundred years of of uh, unfair treatment and the, the abuse language the that we have have to deal with, and uh, and specifically Mexican Americans have had to to deal with this abuse for for two hundred years, and and the 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 the, the amazing thing is that. We've been here, you know, before America was formed, Mexicans were in this lands and we still seen as, as invaders, as, as newcomers. And, um, and this, is, this is having a very negative effect on our, on our community. Um, we, we see it, we see the consequences of it in, in media. We see how we continue to be invisible, Hollywood has, ignore Mexican Americans for a hundred years. And again, now that we haven't been here, you know, thousands of cowboys movies where Mexicans should have been in the center because Mexicans invented cowboys. Uh, and of course we were invisible. Uh, and that continues even to today. You know, we know that the Latinos are the least represented people in Hollywood. And this, uh, in this last uh, Oscar list uh, shows an improvement, and we're very happy about that. 14 uh, Latinos, but sadly, only four Mexican Americans. And, and although we're 70 percent of the the uh, Latinos in the U.S., which which means that we continue to be the least represented of the least represented. And and when represented, we we are represented in the most awful, unfair false ways and uh, and that's what you know that's why the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation is really working hard to change that because we can't forget that 
we are, we really, who we really are is 40 million Americans who are hardworking. You know, there's research showing that we are the hardest working Latinos and that we're the hardest working Americans. And, uh, you know, 40 million people working hard, being very successful. But, but what we see in Hollywood is just the, 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 uh, the unfair, this, this uh, uh, bad narrative that has, we have to get rid of, you know. When we don't come from a place of, of, of just drug infested, we come from a, one of the most uh, uh, you know, advanced nations with you know, the, one of the largest economies with the biggest culture. And, um, and we, the Mexican American Culture Education Foundation are working hard to, to, to change that in Hollywood and, and to change that. Uh, we specifically create a strong Mexican American film industry, and, and uh, we have work scholarships, grants for films, and so many other things. So, uh, with that said, uh, I am so excited to introduce one of the people that that really is changing the narrative uh, in, in in California and in the entire country. Uh, Senator Marilena Durazo is one of those people that, that, um, that, that with her hard work uh, is, is you know, protecting and, and uh, you know, uh, fighting for, for fair treatment for, for people in the, in the fields, immigrants, and of course, all of us here in California. So, um, uh, Senator Marilena Durazo, we, this today is about learning about your history, your path, how is, we want to see all these young people, they're going to see this video, or they're, they're seeing this video, um, learn how is the, uh, this uh, uh, lovely Mexican-American who, you know, who is the daughter of immigrants, and who, um, when, when you were young, we read the, the, on your bio, that you actually had to work hard with your hands, and and you know, go around the, the fields and 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 you know, pick some fruits. Uh, tell us a little bit. We want to learn about your experience. And could you tell us a little bit how how it was um, growing up as a Mexican American and 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 having to do all of those things? Yes. Well, um, thank you both very much, and it's it's great to have this conversation. And I think. When I do a more in-depth, you know, conversation with uh, compañeros like like yourselves, it helps me to, you know, think through what have I been through in, in my life. So thank you uh, very much. I, I think, that, um, you know, first of all, it was my parents who came here. My father came first. He had a family uh, member, one of his uncles, and so you know, who came before him and. Back then, it wasn't uh, in some ways as difficult or as complicated to uh, to get the visa to come in and then eventually, uh, you know, gain legal residency. But my father came, worked in the fields, and then later my mom, he, had, he brought my mom and my two oldest sisters who were born uh, in, um, in Mexico. And so they all came, but this was in, in Sonora. So then they all came um, to Madera in the San Joaquin Valley. Mm -hmm. And the rest is just, uh, you know, like you said, it was town to town to town. My dad was completely convinced that, that way, that's the way through that work that we were going to be, you know, justly compensated and we were going to be able to have the opportunities that everybody uh, else did. So, you know, from the, moments I could walk, you know, I, I was given a task, me and my younger brother who were closest in age. And, you know, we either brought water, we take, took it around to all of us. We we're kind of like the crew that my dad, you know, would negotiate with the grower, um, get paid so much and you pick this orchard or you pick here. Um, it was, it was very, very difficult work. And frankly, uh, to me, it was like, why? Why do we have to work so hard? And, and yet, you know, we don't, get, we don't get out of it what it seems fair that we should have gotten. So I always had that, that question in my mind. 
the, the work of a whole family. I was number seven in our family of 11. Um, and it just, there was just something wrong with it. Um, extremely hard work. But my dad, I wouldn't say he loved the work, but he was proud of his work. And that's the other thing I couldn't understand. Are you kidding? <laughs> this is extremely difficult. It's really hard. You get up early in the morning and it's either really, really hot or it's really cold. Um, you know, there's no in between and there was no moment of sort of rest. It was just this constant. So, it's, you know, I always, those kinds of questions just always came to my mind, the unfairness of it. It sounds, it sounds like, uh, like your family is, was, was, you know, very proud of hard work and it's very consistent of what, what the research shows that we Mexican Americans are extremely hard workers, and then we have we take a lot of pride in in in, in being hard workers and achieving things, and we feel that we should deserve something because of that. And and of course, we know that that hasn't always been the case. I have a question: um, Do you feel that any specific childhood experience, uh, ha you know, gave you the 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 drive the 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 you know that extra push to to become as successful as, as you have I mean what childhood experience would you attribute? Well, I I think it was you know my my dad always said because we would complain that we weren't somehow why weren't we getting paid what we think we should have gotten paid and he said what matters is you do the best that you can do on this job. I don't care how hard it is, you're gonna do your best. And we just couldn't understand that. How could you do your best for such low poverty wages? Um, but he, he taught us that you do your best, period. And he would not allow us to do, you know, um, you know sort of half, you know, Half the, half the work, half ass <laughs> is another I'm, word for it. I, I'm, I'm already loving your dad. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was, it, he just, and so, um, you know, I didn't quite understand that fully when I was a kid and as we were growing up, um, but later grew to respect uh, very much what he was trying to teach us and as difficult as it was and as much as we mm -hmm. complained. Uh, you know, he also protected and which I figured out through time he also was very strict especially with us girls and sometimes and there is a, a bit of machismo of course connected uh, to you know old school Mexicanos but what drove him uh, was he wanted to protect the girls mm -hmm. from the kind of sexual abuse and sexual harassment that mm -hmm. was very common in the fields um, wow. and so you know, at the time, again, didn't quite understand what he was trying to do, but he was really trying to protect us. And in his way, he didn't sit down and have these little chats with us. He just like laid down the rules and that and that was the rule. So mm -hmm. there were so many things that weren't explained to us by our, our parents. But in the end, I think proved to be um, good values that he was teaching us. Yeah, yeah, it seems like he taught by example. Yes, right? absolutely, uh, absolutely. I was reading, I was reading your, um, your bio and, and tell me if I, I was incorrect, you, you, um, you met Cesar Chavez and uh, how was that? I mean, that's, you know, first of all, you, you, you look too young, but second, that's quite, <laughs> that's quite an impressive thing. <laughs> It must but, have been something special. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yes. So uh, my late husband, Miguel, who had gone right after high school and worked, uh, recruited by Dolores uh, Huerta to join as, as an organizer, of course, knew Dolores very well and, and Caesar. Um, although I worked, our family worked in the fields, uh, we, you know, we didn't connect on that, um, that level uh, with, with Cesar. When I met Cesar was when I was already um, the, the leader of the uh, Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union. Oh. And so he was come, he came to LA to um, ask for support. And so of course we did everything we could. We had a, a, a few events uh, with him. Somebody just 
sent me a picture of, of one of those events where I was, I was there. Um, and so he was helping us. And then, um, so there were two things that stand out in my mind. One is we were having a very, very long, protracted, difficult fight with uh, Hyatt Hotels at that time. And um, he came, we were at the point where we were just sort of ready to give it up. Like it was just too long, too difficult. And he came to speak to our members about what struggles are like and how you win and how important they were as special individuals to keep the fight going so that we can win. And he was just an extraordinary down to earth um, human being talking mm -hmm. to them in their experiences as immigrants, as poor people, not to feel less, to feel powerful. It, it was quite a, a, a very, very, personally a very uh, um, important day in, in my life. And the other was when me and Miguel went to go visit him when he was uh, doing his uh, last fast. Um, and we went into the, the little room where he was at, you know, just a little um, single bed there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and still he was, you know, very joking. And um, it, it was a few days after he started. And uh, he joked around about having a, a dream of eating tacos, uh, tacos de cabeza. And he goes, when in my when in my wildest dreams would I ever eat that? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was fortunate enough to have those special moments with him. An impressive figure for sure. Uh, it seems like, like, you know, you're, you're between your father's, you know, desire to, to, to be fairly compensated and, and his pride of work, you know, uh, and you 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 become a fighter for for the the people the laborers the the, the, the immigrants. Uh, is that what drove you to 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 go to go through all the schooling that you had to go through, or what? I mean, we know you went to Saint Mary College in Moraga. We know that you you have a law degree. Uh, um, what drove you to to you know, work so hard to get education? Well, I think it was actually a combination of the work ethic that my parents, my father um, embedded in us. Um, the, the other, my mom was the sort of the flip side, which she was extremely hard work. You can imagine raising all these kids, getting up really early in the morning and making the tortillas to make the burritos for lunch and all this. Um, but she was, a, uh, she was really feisty. And so when my dad went to go try to negotiate with the growers what we were going to get paid for this orchard or for this piece, you know, she was always picándole, you know, de atrás. And, a Filzardo, pídeles más, como que es, es todo. <laughs> so there was a side, I think I, you know, we picked up from her, which is, come on, we, we deserve more. And my dad was always so sort of trusting that our hard work would be recognized. And mom was like, no, I don't think so. You need to demand more. And I think the combination is, is um, you know, the, the kinds of things that I think we were, you know, that I was exposed to my whole life and, and my family. I also had, I have a, a great um, respect for my older sisters and brothers who, a brother who, um, Without them, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to college because they dropped out of high school, not because they were unable to stay, not because they didn't want to study. It's because our family needed them to get a job to help support the rest of us. Mm -hmm. So imagine the sacrifice that they went through exactly. Exactly. of not finishing high school in order to help dad you know, get a, and get a job um, somewhere else as we were getting older and that we couldn't you know, uh, travel from town to town um, and stayed more in, in the in the San Joaquin Valley. So all those things are part of what I'm grateful for, um, gave me the opportunity to go to college. And, um, you know, I had to put my, you know, put in my effort as well. It just didn't fall from the sky, right? No, nada cae del cielo, así. No. But, but it really uh, was a combination of all these things. And, and, the Chicano movement and the oh. farm worker movement, all of this, the anti-war movement, the Chicano moratorium, 
all these were happening all at the same time. So it was both, you know, growing up with my family under those circumstances, but it was also all around. The environment was, let's, let's push back. Let's demand, let's open those doors to higher education. You know, at St. Mary's, I was only about the third class ever in their history that they had recruited Chicanos from East LA and from the San Joaquin Valley and from Sacramento. That was just unheard of. They had never done that before. Well, that just didn't happen because of nothing. It happened exactly. because there were people out on the streets and making these demands. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and it seems like we continue we, we continue to need to do so, right? I mean, it's like you you fought so hard, and so many people have fought so hard, and we still have 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 a ways to go. Uh, I see that you you again looking at your bio, your history, that you I mean you've been you have so many different uh, 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 important positions in the labor you know segment trying to help people get be uh, better better wages you know nicer uh, uh, compensations nicer benefits uh, which of those experiences do you do you cherish most? Oh, what I cherish the most is most of my time in the labor movement has been around hotel workers and mm. particularly housekeepers, mm. Latina women, Latina women who were raising families, mm -hmm. Latina women who would go into the hotels and clean and clean the beds and were, uh, you know, treated terribly you know, the quota of how many rooms they had to clean was irregardless, never considered, you know, the pain in their elbows, the pain in their back, the pain in their waist, their knees, how much they suffered that year after year after year of doing 20 to 25 rooms a day, you know, was just intolerable for them to stand up and realize that they had power in their hands if they came together. Because um, it, it was about health and safety on the job. It was about their bodies mm -hmm. that hurt a lot because they were broken, you know, every single day. And their demand for health care, their mm -hmm. demands for better wages so that they could one day dream of buying a, a casita. So being around those women was just, just extraordinary. It was just, you know, amazing to me. And so, you know, I felt like we were all partners, like they taught me and yet I could teach them too. Uh, mm -hmm. And together they rose to be the backbone so that today, you know, housekeepers are, you know, with the union contract are, you know, almost $25 an hour, you know, plus well, free family well. health insurance, plus a pension plan, plus a legal plan. These are, these are conditions that would never have happened in a unionized uh, hotel had it not been for their courage years ago. Wow, wow, yeah, we're so proud of you. So proud of you that you, you help so much in that. And, and of course, because of all the amazing things you've done, you, you, you were, you, I mean, you're the, you were the first woman to become Secretary of Treasury of, the, the, of Los, Los Angeles County. That's very, very impressive. That's a recognition of all your hard work. Um, could, you, could you share a little bit about that experience? Sure. Um, well, I remember when I um, decided that, yes, I wanted to take um, this leadership role with the rest of the unions. There were a couple of union leaders, um, some men, who, uh, you know, pushed hard on me. And they said, well, what makes you think that you could defend a construction worker? What makes you think you could defend a firefighter? You know, why should someone like you, um, you know, take on this role? Because there were uh, 300 local unions in this federation. And, um, and I you know, it was a very simple response. And that was that I knew how to fight for workers. I knew how to fight side by side with workers and I devoted my whole life to it. So frankly, to me, it didn't matter if you were an electrician or a teacher or a firefighter or a dishwasher, 
you. You all deserve the same, uh, uh, the same respect for what you need as a human being. And uh, so, you know, at first it was, it was like that, that kind of uh, uh, a tug, tug. But um, in the end, you know, they agreed and they elected me and uh, I was proud. And I, I learned a lot. I continue to learn a lot. You know, I don't know what it's like to be a construction worker, but I went up 50 stories to this to, with this elevator that they build, you know, that's you're kind of on the outside. <laughs> I went up to visit iron workers. I mean, that was an extraordinary experience. Um, I went to apprenticeship programs. I went to visit um, uh, industrial laundromats. Um, uh, and, you know, it was just, you know, worker after worker, hum they're human beings. Yeah. And we just need to show uh, more of our clout uh, as human beings. Just like right now, there's all this talk about essential workers, essential workers. But what does that mean? If we don't show it with tangible things, if we don't show it uh, by, you know, giving the respect either to the wages or, you know, working conditions. So, you know, there were so many things I continued to learn at, in, in the labor movement, the LA labor movement. And I also went all, all the way to the National AFL-CIO Executive Council. Wow. Well, that's an impressive, powerful Mexican-American woman. We're so proud of you. Um, now tell me something, and this is, you know, a, a, a question that, that I always wonder, you know, you, you've done so much and, and, uh, I mean, you, you, the reputation that you have is impeccable. Do you feel, uh, that maybe if your last name was, uh, uh Italian or French and not Mexican American, you would be running for governor or for president? Which, which you deserve to do that? Do you feel that there is that, 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 um, that um, fairness towards Mexican-American Latinos? Oh, there's no doubt that there's unfairness. Um, I wouldn't trade my culture and my history uh, for anything in the world, um, even if it did bring me closer to a different uh, position. Uh, we have we have an extraordinary history here uh, and throughout the world. Um, and it's just uh, too bad that not enough people see it, uh, not enough people pay attention to it and they're not respectful of it. So it's our job to make them understand. Uh, we have this uh, uh, as the head of the Latino Legislative Caucus uh, under the former chair, uh, assembly member Lorena Gonzalez, we started what's called the Unseen Latinas initiative. Unseen Latinas. Mm -hmm. Why? Because even, even when Latinos are recognized, it's Latina women who are still below that. Always fourth or fifth mm -hmm. or sixth, always at the bottom. So we just have to push back on it. Um, and I feel better about doing that than sort of writing on the... Um, coattails of, you know, uh, an easier life. We, we, we've got a lot to do, but I'm just so, I get excited. You know, I, I feel proud. Uh, I don't so feel, you know, I don't feel bad about anything. I don't regret uh -huh. anything. I just get more excited. Um, in the, in the same, uh, uh, you know, question following that, um, you know, uh, you probably heard a little bit of my introduction in regards to the to, to Hollywood and how we we Mexican Americans have been. Uh, I mean, we, we've been erased. We've been in this country forever, and you know, and you know, there, California has always been filled with Mexicans, and Hollywood being in California still treated us like we didn't even exist for for decades and decades, and. Uh, and we, you know, we still, we still pretty invisible and in, in TV and in movies and, and Mexican Americans, as I mentioned, you know, are at the bottom of Latinos, even at the bottom of Latinos. So we, what do you, you know, what do you think we need to do to change that? Well, there are some pioneers, you know, 
uh, yourself, you know, there are pioneers, Moctezuma. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there are a number of, of Mexican Americans and Latinos who are pioneering in certain, um, in certain industries in yeah. certain parts of our community. Um, and they begin to tear down those walls. Who were the yeah. very first ones who started Chicano studies, right? Must have been 50, 50 years ago. Uh, Juan Gomez Quinones. I mean, there's, there's so many, but they, they, they were the ones who pushed and pushed and opened those doors for others. Um, yeah. So we rely on those um, innovators, on those, in those pioneers to care about the rest of the community. Thanks. Because two, some in our community find success and they follow it. And that's yeah. the end of that. And they don't look back and they, they pretend as if it was just them and their talent that got them where they're going. Of course, that's part of it. But the other part of it is that from the bottom, we're pushing. We're pushing. So nobody should ever feel like on their own, by themselves, they got to the level of success. Um, so I, I think more of us uh, doing that, we also need to make the connection, uh, you know, between the, the lack of a positive view of our Latino Mexican uh, uh, heritage in the entertainment industry. Um, we got to connect that with, that's an opportunity that our youth are missing out on. So let's see it as a, a, a denial of the same economic opportunity as others are getting. Not that so much, well, um, you know, we want them to go work in the entertainment industry. That's an economic opportunity they are being denied. Exactly. And that's how we should see whatever we are um, um, held back from doing it. Uh, I think it's very deliberate in this system to keep deliberate. people of color, to keep Mexican Americans, to keep us you know, in a controlled situation. So we got no choice but to push back. And there are a lot more in the industries, but nowhere near. We just got our first appointment, a nomination to the California Supreme Court, a Latina woman. So um, bravo. we, you know, bravo, but okay, let's continue to open yeah, the door. We need a lot more than one, right? A lot more than one. We're 40% <laughs> of California. Exactly, exactly. And um, wonderful. Well, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's very, very important. Thank you for that, that very, very good advice. And yes, we need to get together. And you're, I guess, I mean, you're speaking for experience, right? Getting together is what, what, what helps. And, and that's what we're trying to do with, with the Mexican American Culture Education Foundation, you know, create a, uh, a strong, film community to help each other in um so right thank you you have, we know, you we have know. those you have those scholarships you have a mentorship i mean that would not have happened without a few of you yeah, you know, yeah creating like, that. and it's going to get bigger and bigger and you will have that impact we will have that impact absolutely absolutely for sure um Tell us, tell us, what are you working on right now that is getting you excited? I mean, you, we, we could talk all night about all the great accomplishments you've done in the past, but now we're excited about all the things that you're doing. I know, because I know I, I've heard you before. I heard you speak in multiple times recently, and, and it's very empowering and, and very energetic. And tell us a little bit about those things that you're working on. Well, um, I'm really proud that we um with with advocates we were able to make some changes this last year um that seemed um not possible um uh, for a long time um one and the most i think impactful as far as numbers and the 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 total number of people impacted is so big that i think it's going to have a uh, uh, a really amazing impact, positive impact. And that is um, close to or over a million uh, undocumented uh, low-income men and women are gonna have the right to healthcare. Mm -hmm. They are uninsured because they can't afford it. They're low income, they're uninsured. And so they rarely go in advance of getting mm -hmm. um, health uh, care. Uh, because they can't afford it. 
So they wait until they're really ill, until you know it's become a chronic illness, and then it becomes much, much more difficult for them to control the health in their lives. Mm -hmm. So to be able to win that for over a, a million um, is a huge, it's gonna have a cumulative huge effect on our community. That's what I'm, I'm hoping. Um, and it's, to me, it's an extension of what I fought for with you know, janitors and housekeepers and construction workers, which was healthcare. And nobody should be denied that human right of healthcare, but it gets lost in all kinds of rhetoric. It gets lost in a lot of racism. Um, and so somehow, you know, dating back to Pete Wilson, um, our communities, the distinction was made. Oh, you're undocumented. You don't have a right to healthcare. Um, even though you work every day, you pay taxes, even though you contribute to this economy. So um, starting with uh, Ricardo Lara when he was here and passed the baton and we've taken it now. So uh, um, uh, undocumented will be covered um, by healthcare in this, in this state. Um, that's not happened in any other state across the country. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of what I'm, I'm excited that we're gonna be able to take that out to our community as their victory as what they need and should have always had. Nobody should have had to be out there fighting for it, should have been a given, uh, but uh, we're gonna make that happen. Good job, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. You know, you seem to be fighting very much for, for, the, for the immigrants, you know, and uh, I guess it's, it's close to us. I'm an immigrant, I, I, you know, I moved here from Mexico and, uh, and I experienced you know, all the, the ups and downs of, 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 of our Mexican-American experience. You know, I consider myself a, a Mexican-American by choice because I'm, you know, I'm an American citizen, although I'm, I'm born in Mexico. And um, I think that, that um, uh, you know, helping, helping those people that have been here for 20 years, working hard as, you know, and they, they still don't get uh, an opportunity to, to legalize the situation and, and they have such an unfair situation, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so well, thank I, you. Thank you for yeah. doing that and for and fighting I, for immigrants. And I think, you know, it's, it's um, every generation have our connections to immigrants from, from Mexico um, and from, you know, other Latino yes. countries, every generation yes. we're here, they're yes. there. That border is not going anywhere. Those countries are going nowhere. The U.S. will, this will always be, this will always be part of Mexico, you know, even with the, with the fronteras. Um, but I think what's, uh, what's important in, in all of this is that we have that connection, you know, even if I was third or fourth generation, I have a connection still. Um, something like 70, 75% of, of, um, of undocumented are, have family that are either born here or legal residents or citizens, yeah. naturalized yeah. citizens. But we have a continuous connection. Nobody could say, here's the end of immigration and immigrants uh, for Latinos or Mexicans. We're, we're always gonna have that. So even though we may be here fourth generation, we may not directly benefit from uh, an immigration uh, policy our community will, and it's part of what's used against our community. It's part of how you um, criminalize our community mm -hmm. because whether you put into a detention center, which is like a prison, or you put in jail, mm -hmm. our Mexican Latinos are in the huge numbers are being criminalized and put into the mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. it, it affects us all. So. Um, you know, these, there's no separation of these, of these issues. And yeah. we've got to fight on all fronts. Yes, you're right. And it's so interesting what you're saying that, that we, there's a continuum in the, that we as Mexican Americans have been here for, for hundreds of years, right? And you know, my, in my case, although I'm an immigrant, you know, mm -hmm. um, but my great grandfather was born in Texas and I totally forgot about that. <laughs> you know, before the, 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 
before the, the beginning of last century, you know, I already had uh, family here in the U.S. And um, so, I mean, of course, we, we you know, it's, we're, we're neighbors, Mexico and the U.S., you know, we, we're always interacting, you know, that's, that's right, never going right. to never going to end. Such an and, and the and the industries are also you think, think about Arizona and and uh, and Mexico and the mining. Right. Yeah. Um, and the miners, uh, my grandfather worked in the, in the copper mines, worked in, in Cananea at the, at the mines there. Mm. I mean, the industries also bring us together and connect us. I have friends who always talk about Los Mineros um, and the connection there and then end up in, you know, Wilmington or they end up in, in East LA or La Puente. Uh, but there's, there is a historic connection that nobody can erase, and it's always going to be there. Yeah, yeah, we, we can't forget that. Um, your story is amazing. We're so exciting. Um, I have a, a funny question to ask. Um, so if you, if you could look back, I mean, there's going to be a lot of young viewers, and, um, and, and if you could you know, go back in time and, and see young 10 year old Maria Elena, you know, taking the fields and, you know, fighting for the future. Uh, what advice would you give her to be able to, to, to be as successful as you are today? What advice would you give young uh, uh, Latinas, Mexican-American women and women in general, because you're an example for all women, by the way, you, you know, you, you know, fighting in, in the labor world, which was an all men thing. And you were there in the middle of it. What advice would you give this, this, this young ladies? I would say, you know, education, education, education. And, um, because education opens up your eyes. Education um, opens up the world of opportunities, opens up the world of, you know, imagining what you could be. And, you know, education uh, reminds you that you're capable of learning whatever, you know, it is you decide you want to learn. Uh, and if, uh, you know, I have a 13-year-old and an 11-year-old granddaughters and what I want for them is not to tell them what to be. Uh, what I, you know, try to um, tell them is just try this, try that, you know, study so that you could have whatever option in front of you that you want. If you want to be a soccer player or if you want to be a, a, an actor, you know, if you study, you could have those options and anything else. Uh, but if you don't study, if you don't have a, a sense of learning, uh, then you're going to be stuck and you're not going to be able to get out of that. And, and you're going to be limited in what you want to do in your life. You're not going to be all that you can be as, as, the, as the saying goes. So I just say study um, and, and have empathy and, and care for others, you know, study and be part of a community. Um, you know, when I went to law school, I was a single mom and, uh, I was working during the day. I had my, my son was, uh, about five, six years old. And, um, just so during the day I would take him to a daycare center and start talking to one of the women there, uh, childcare providers. And I said, you know, I really want to go back to school. I want to go to law school. That was always my dream to go to law school. And, um, and she says, well, why don't you do it? And I said, well, it's really hard. I have to go to night school. You know, what am I going to do with my, my son, Mario? And uh, she says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of him. And do you know that for four years that I went to night school, law school, she would take care of him and never, ever allowed me to pay her. Wow. Um, that's that's the, that's the kind of a community, you know, um, privilege that I have had, you know, of having those kind of people in my life. Uh, so uh, you can do it with people around you. 
-hmm. So not only should you succeed personally, but you should care about helping others to succeed as well. Yeah. Well, you've been an example of that. You know, you've been a successful person that has uh, spent your life helping others succeed and, and have better opportunities. And, and um, we can see how your, 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 your father and your mother had such a powerful influence in your, your, you know, your drive for, for fairness and your, your love of hard work. And, and you know, so uh, I think those are some of those, those things are those, that, that Mexican American spirit, you know, how we such hard workers and, and um, believe in fairness. And that's something that is also very, very common in our community. So mm -hmm. we're very proud of you. We, we look forward to seeing you to continue the fight, continue to represent us uh, uh, because you're doing such an amazing job and we're, we're, we're very thankful. We know how busy you are and, and we're honored that you, you know, took the time to, to, uh, to be with us tonight. And, and, and I know that people listening to your story will be, will be ignited, will be excited, and will, there will be future uh, young Latinas, Mexican-Americans who want to be like, like Senator Marilena Durazo. So thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, you, look forward to seeing you again in the future. And um, thank you. Abelardo, my friend. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was very inspiring. And a lot of uh, viewers, both on Facebook and uh, on Zoom, just give you a big applause there. Eli Sanchez, for instance, give you the claps, the clapping. Uh, Jose Montoya as well. Don, Dan Guerrero, a good friend of ours. Maria Elena is a modern day soldadera. <laughs> we do have a question here from an anonymous attendee. How do we get big tobacco to stop promoting to our communities? Specifically, how can we hold big tobacco accountable for the health inequ inequities that nicotine dependency has caused in our communities? Yeah, uh, well, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, we, they're, they're always looking for ways, uh, you know, these uh, flavored uh, tobaccos, uh, you know, this vape, vaping, uh, it's, these are new uh, ways to get into our community to make it appear as if, uh, um, you know, uh, it's okay, as if it's healthier. Um, so we've got to continue uh, to fight back on that front. Uh, uh, but uh, we need everybody to, you know, get the word out how unhealthy, how dangerous uh, these different forms of of uh, of the drug because it's really right. It's uh, it's an addiction, right? Uh, that's that was the whole point of of having uh, uh, tobacco is to addict a, a community. So uh, there's again just we've got to uh, create a greater awareness as to how these new flavored uh, tobaccos are really are meant to addict our young people, you know. And so as they get older, they'll they'll continue with it. So we're going to, we've got legislation. We're going to keep on fighting on that front. All right. Very worthy cause there. Uh, Ma uh, Guadalupe Diaz Isa, uh, she has a comment. So proud of Maria Elena Durazo. Met her when she was with Unite. I worked with the firm that represented Unite at the time, joined on demonstrations, marches, in support of Los Trabajadores. It was such a privilege to know a hardworking Latina woman who does for and represents hard labor workers. So that was, uh, and then Maria C. Carrillo, she quite a few comments here on the Facebook page, but she specifically talked about the dreamers. Our dreamers are some of our essential workers that have been on the front line working harder than ever, risking their lives. Use our voices for those who are afraid to speak. Right. Um, and speaking of dreamers, we got, uh, we ha cannot give up on our demands for a path to citizenship. Um, several generations now. Uh, because remember, it was, it was uh, in 1986, the last time that we had a path to citizenship. Um, so it's been uh, 30, right, um, over 35 years. We have got to continue to make that a demand of our elected officials at the federal level. We can't give up on that. Uh, too many people who are still subject uh, to getting deported um, and 
we just can't let that kind of division and assault in our com communities uh, continue to linger. So keep at it. Uh, a few months ago, I was privileged to get arrested with uh, Cherla and Helica Salas and um, several others say that no matter who gets elected, we're going to keep on fighting and demanding a path to citizenship. All right, thank you. Uh, so thank Bravo. you. Let's we have a couple more questions here. Uh, Jerry Velasco, well, he's saying thank you for what you do and have done, Maria Elena. Uh, she's one of the best, always speaking up for our people, has dedicated her life for the betterment of our community. Thank you. Hey, Jerry. All right. So with that, uh, that's all the questions we have. We have a few comments, but uh, thank you, D Dr. Ruiz, um, uh, Senator uh, Durazo. Uh, any final thoughts? Thank you so much. And I so I look forward to going back to La Plaza and, and uh, being out there and dancing on those uh, in those summer nights. All right. Well, summer and the summer salsa is coming up. We're preparing our program <laughs> as we speak, and in a couple of weeks. We'll have the complete schedule out. So thank you for, and we look forward to you returning to La Plaza as you as, you as well, Dr. Ruiz. La Plaza, thank you so much. Thank you. God bless. Dios los cuide. Gracias por todo. Muchas gracias. Nice. Okay, well, thank you all out there who joined us on Zoom and Facebook Live. This has been a, a really good session. Dr. Ruiz always brings the best guests. Uh, coming up this week, uh, return to La Plaza, uh, uh, our first program of 2020 uh in there at la plaza itself uh, a documentary ruben salazar man in the middle directed by philip rodriguez who will be there to answer questions make comments about the making of the movie uh and that'll be at seven o'clock this thursday it's free of charge come on down please and then on friday uh back to in casa con la plaza with dan guerrero himself with guest pepe serna a latino hollywood film vet so join us on Friday the 25th at 7 o'clock here on En Casa Con La Plaza on Zoom or Facebook Live. And with that, we would like to thank our sponsors once again, CVS Health, uh, Aetna, Kaiser Permanente. Uh, let's see, Ken we, so, we have a few more. Let's see, we have the Union Pacific Foundation, California Humanities, National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences. So, muchas gracias, Dr. Ruiz. Muchas gracias, Senator Durazo. And gracias a todos. We'll see you next time. Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.